Now here again is David Lowe's. David, masterful um, m statement on faith. And uh, as a uh, former English teacher, I appreciated your wonderful <laughs> references to Auden and Tolkien. You come from a long line of Lutheran pastors. Your father is a pastor. Mm -hmm. Your mother had a number of pastors on her side of the family. Can you define a particular moment in your own faith journey when you took the leap of faith? Oh, that's a great question. I think that happens at a lot of times. It happens in times of struggle, uh, when you begin to wonder whether God is there, whether God cares. And then you begin to wonder whether you're allowed to wonder that. Um, and it happens at times of opportunity, too, when you sense that God is calling you to something beyond yourself. So I don't know if there's any one dramatic time, but there's certainly many points where the liveliness or activeness of faith uh, has just been pulsing, has just been so apparent that this life of faith we have isn't static, but is, is this ongoing adventure. And I wanted to pick up on that because that's one of the things I liked that you said. Faith really is an adventure that we're invited into, isn't it? And what, what inspires you to invite others on this, this journey with you, I guess? Because it's not about answers necessarily. It's about questions and, and allowing ourselves that process. Yeah, I think a lot of folks think that having faith is to have no doubts, no uncertainty at all. When I think it's precisely the opposite, that is living faithfully is struggling to believe even with a lack of evidence. And I get excited about allowing people to be more realistic about the world and about the challenges that face, face them, and then to be more realistic about the hope that, that pulls them on too. The uh, Chicago philosopher Mortimer Adler once wrote a book called How to Think About God, and he himself described uh, himself as uh, a believer in the God of philosophy hmm. and the tension between the two, God of philosophy, God of religion. He said he had one foot over the edge of the chasm between the two. What do you say to people who have one foot over the edge? Yeah, I would tell people folks in my congregation particularly that were struggling, that, that I would count myself as 51% a person of faith and 49% agnostic. Mm -hmm. Not atheist, because I often find atheists to be more sure that God doesn't exist than I'm sure God does. <laughs> but agnostic, a certain uh, admitting that you can't tell for sure, you can't prove it. And when folks imagine faith to be that lively, that it isn't about knowing everything, I think they find it more inviting because it connects with their own experience of struggling to believe, not just sitting back comfortably knowing all the time. And, and there is a risk inherent in that, that that you talked about, it, kind of a gamble to make that choice to, to go along with that, isn't it? Which can be very exciting to someone who is maybe in the position that Lydia is talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Being a person of faith is staking your life on the claims in Scripture that there is more to this world than readily meets the eye. And it is to take a risk, to take a wager, but that's what makes it so much more exciting. Mm -hmm. now, now, who have been, of course, your parents, wonderful role mm -hmm. models for you, but uh, along the line uh, and in your pilgrimage, who have been others who have informed you most about your faith style? Yeah, clearly my parents and teachers and significant friends um, but I count the whole cloud of witnesses that the letter to the author of the Hebrews talks about a little later in the same uh, chapter, that whole cloud of witnesses as those who inspire us in our faith, particularly when I think about how many characters in the Bible struggle and fail and doubt, um, from the uh, prophets and those who wrote the Psalms to the disciples and even Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane or crying out in despair on the cross, all of these people struggled. Uh, and one of the stories that regularly inspires me is the story of Jacob wrestling with the angel. Because to me, that's what the life of faith is, is more like. Not just knowing for sure, but wrestling and struggling and refusing to give up and crying out at the end of the night, I will not let you go until you bless me. Or the man who runs up to Jesus in Mark and says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Those characters are so real, I think it helps us to be real about the challenges and the opportunities of the life of faith. You've used the, the word struggle a number of times in our visit. Have you faced any particular personal struggle in your life when your faith has been shaken? Oh, uh, 
I think all of us have, if, if we're open to be honest about it. Certainly uh, the loss of friends or a family member, in my case, the uh, brother-in-law when my mm -hmm. nephews were very young. At all of those times, you ask very naturally and understandably, how could God let this happen? Or is there a God? Or if there's a God, does this God care? And I think those times of honest probing are exactly what faith is about. And that's what, that, it, that reminds us that faith and hope are inseparable companions. Absolutely. I'm curious to ask you, as a, as a teacher at the seminary, what are you experiencing with your students uh, in terms of living the Bible today, taking this risk? What are some of the questions they're asking you as they're going to go out and, and minister people? Yeah, it makes ministry itself far more exciting. I would think, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Sometimes it's, I'll tell my students, I think there are two understandings of Christian faith. Both of them share a sense that this world is a tumultuous place full of dangers and opportunities and troubles. One understanding of the Christian faith is that when you come to faith, all the tremors should stop and everything should fall into place. Mm -hmm. The other un thinks that Christian faith allows you to keep your footing in the midst of the tremors. And that's what ministry is about, and to invite students into imagining that they don't have to have all the answers, but really are called to help people keep their footing, to proclaim a word that inspires them again. To keep their footing, that, that would imply being sustained by faith. Yeah, and when you think about it, it makes sense of why we go to church. Uh, I think there are lots of reasons to go to church. It might be part of your cultural heritage. It might be you want your children to have values. You might be looking for community. But for me, I go to church out of a sense of desperation, hmm. that it's hard to believe for more than about seven days in a row. You know, you hear this word on Sunday about a God of love and mercy and forgiveness, and your faith is kindled, and then you go out into the world, and by Friday, some weeks by Monday, <laughs> you really begin to wonder, could this possibly be true? And then you come back to church to hear it again, because it's hard to believe for more than a week or I so. I totally agree. I, I Going to church on Sunday helps me plug back in and remind me of what's most important in my week. And I, it's hard for me to imagine not going on a regular basis, but there are some people that don't feel they need to go. Yeah. Wh wh how do you feel about that? Um, I mean, everyone has their own spiritual practice, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think that it's hard to find the same kind of, uh, of hope and inspiration since community other than, than church. Sometimes I'll share uh, an example of uh, some parishioners of mine a number of years ago said that uh, on a Sunday when they couldn't get to church, when something came up, one of the kids was sick or there's a crisis in the home, they do this quick little two-minute inventory of the week they just had and the week to come, and then try and figure out quickly who needed church more. Uh, which I just, I love that image and love the idea of pastors and congregational leaders thinking about crafting worship and preaching so that people would feel like it was a necessity. It was bread for the journey and they didn't want to miss it. And, and you've used the word community uh, several times as well. Yeah. I mean, the community of faith. I mean, there, that's, there is no other replacement for that, is there? Yeah, to share your struggles, to share your successes, to look together for opportunities, but to be joined to a body of believers. Now, now you have two young children, David, mm -hmm. you and your wife in Minneapolis. Um, tell us about Sunday school and how you uh, talk with your children about faith in 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think Sunday School and Church for Children is where they begin to learn this story. And they begin to know that the story really doesn't end, that the Bible isn't this book that tells us about people way back there, but it tells a story that's ongoing and unfolding. And they begin to know those characters like they know their extended family. And so as they grow up, my hope and prayer is that they see themselves as a part of that family and called into that same adventure of faith. Our invitation to live the Bible today and every day. Thank you, yeah. David.